1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of 1 Samuel. And this really makes sense if you understand, and I'm sure if you're watching this, you probably already do, that Israel has really had a very hard time with idolatry since the very beginning. When God brings them out as a nation from Egypt, the very first thing that they do, I mean, right after seeing all ten plagues, right after walking across the Red Sea on dry land and watching God destroy Pharaoh's army, and right after Moses ascends up to Sinai and they see the presence of God in the distance, the mountain smoking and the, the cloud covering it, all of that, first thing they do, build an idol just like they had in Egypt. I mean, you know that had to be just so infuriating for God, and, and we see the outcome of that in the Scripture. And even before then, we see people connected to the patriarchs kind of waffling on that, like Rachel, when it comes to uh, trying to carry other gods with her other than the one true God. And so this has been a struggle for the Israelite people since the very beginning. And they keep trying to flirt with this sin. It, it's sort of the pet sin of Israel throughout most of the Old Testament history. And so if you understand that, a lot of this makes a lot more sense. And, and you also need to understand that throughout the Judges, and especially the time period in the first few chapters of Samuel, the big rivals for the children of Israel have been a group of pagans known as the Philistines. That's the nation that seems to give them the most trouble when it comes to this particular section of the Bible. So th this has been their big uh, rival since all of this started, and, and they've been fighting back and forth, and the Philistines have taken a lot of Israel cities. We actually saw, and we went over a few, a few days ago, the Philistines actually at one point take the Ark of the Covenant, and they take it away from Israel and try to put it into their temple. That doesn't work out so well for them. But the point is, they're still at this war with the Philistines, and the Philistines are still having a lot of success against Israel on the battlefield. So they're calling to Samuel. They ask him for help, and they, get, they ask him for advice on what they should do. This is his response in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 3-4, through 4, where he says, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart... Remove the foreign gods and the Astaroth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord, and serve him alone, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Astaroth, and served the Lord alone. Now, this is about as strong a statement as it makes anywhere in the Old Testament. There are another that are about equally as strong. But the indication given here, especially if you're looking at the whole of the Old Testament in context, this is one of the very few times where a prophet told Israel to do something and to get rid of these other gods, and they actually listened. They, they heard what he said, and, and there is not even a hint of rebellion. I'm sure that not every single Israelite did this, but the, the implication that is given from the Scripture here is that, for the most part, at this small, specific time during Israel's history— Samuel said, you want to get rid of the Philistines? You really want to be delivered out of their hand? Get rid of these other gods. Get them out of your life. And when you do that, God will deliver you by his hand from the Philistines. And it's a pretty simple request. But considering the fact that throughout the majority of Israel's history, and from this point forward in the scripture, we'll see them essentially do exactly the same thing, when God tells them to get rid of these idols, they typically don't. For whatever reason, Israel's heart seems to always drift back to idolatry. And really up until the, intertestament, uh, the, the uh, intertestamental period, that 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and New Testament, that really seems to be the first time that Israel finally gets the message and for an extended period of time gets these idols 
out of their life and serves only God. It's one of those things that's really simple, but Israel seemed to have a, a pretty big struggle with, despite the fact that it was a fairly simple request. And we'll see how this plays out. We'll see sort of the conclusion and, and what happens as a result of this in 1 Samuel 7, 12 through 14. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin and named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more within the border of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines, so there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Now, I want to point out a couple things. First of all, that's a pretty good end of the story. God said, you do this, I will deliver you from the Philistines' hand. And for once in their history, Israel actually looks at that and goes, yeah, we can do that. And they actually do it. They actually get rid of all the, the Baals and the Astaroths and all these other pagan idols from their life. And then God does exactly what he says he would do. All the cities of Israel that had been taken by the Philistines, those get restored back to him. All these issues that they've been having with Philistine raiders, God allows them to prosper against the Philistines when they go out into battle against them. God protects them and they wind up winning those battles and driving them back. And these attacks by the Philistines are not something that they have to deal with to the level that they had beforehand. They're able to have some success. They're able to have some victory. But I want to draw your attention to the latter part of verse 13. And I'll go ahead and, and pull that back up here. If you look at there in the last part of 13, it does say that the Philistines were subdued, but you'll also notice that and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Well, now hang on. They're subdued, but they're not destroyed. And they're there, but they're not coming through the border of Israel. And it also says the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Now, what does that imply? that the Philistines, they didn't just go away. They were still there. And if the Lord's hand was against the Philistines all the days that Samuel was there, that also implies that, yeah, God was against them and God protected Israel, but they were still attacking Israel. I think there's a really powerful lesson to be drawn from that, that yes, God did deliver them, but he didn't eliminate the problem. I think that we make a mistake a lot of days as modern Christians that we want to pray for God to take a, a problem away completely, that we want him to just fix the problem. And normally God's help doesn't come in that form. Normally what happens is God gives us some kind of boon or some ability to overcome it. He gives us some kind of opportunity to deal with it ourselves. He very rarely just eliminates a problem outright. And that seems to be the same thing that is happening here. Now, God allowed Israel to triumph over the Philistines, where he had not done so previously. He did give the children of Israel a, a certain ability to defeat them, and he also did so so effectively that it says that he restored their cities to them, that the Philistines did not even cross the borders of Israel. But the point is they were still there. They were still an ever-present threat. And to us, especially after God promised that he would deliver them from the Philistines, that might almost seem a little bit unfair. Like, hey, what gives? God said that if we did all this, that he would keep his end of the bargain and deliver us. Well, he did deliver them, but he didn't eliminate the Philistines as a result. And that's the thing I think that we need to understand that when we pray for God to do something for us, or we are really struggling with something, whether it be another person, whether it be some kind of temptation that we're dealing with, whether it be a bad situation that we're in, regardless of what it is, we shouldn't be praying for God to just get rid of the problem altogether most of the time. I mean, I guess it's okay to pray for that, but that's not the answer that we should really be looking for. Instead of praying for a lighter load, most of the time what we should be praying for is a stronger back. 
that when we pray to God to deliver us from a situation, we need to recognize that that doesn't always necessarily mean just getting rid of the problem for us. Normally what it means is that God gives us a way to overcome that obstacle. God didn't eliminate the Philistines. And you know what? He helped them prosper in battle, but they still had to go fight. Samuel brought the Ebenezer, the stone of help, sort of as a a symbol to rally the troops and let them know that God was with them and that God was going to assist them in battle, and he did so to spectacular fashion. But that didn't mean that Israel didn't have to go and fight the battle. I think a lot of times modern Christians make the mistake of assuming that because Jesus Christ came and died for our sins and, and sacrificed and all the work of getting rid of our sin and forgiving it is done, that that almost means that works are unimportant or we don't have to do anything. Well, we don't have to do anything to earn our salvation. That's completely against what the Bible teaches. But that also doesn't imply that we're not supposed to be working and doing what God asks us to do. Just like Israel, God promises you're going to prosper. You are going to beat the Philistines if you do these things, if you do what I ask you, if you are obedient to my voice. I am going to help you overcome your enemies. That doesn't mean you sit back in a lawn chair and wait for your enemies to be destroyed. You still have to go out and fight. So, yes, God is putting forth an effort. And I would even suggest, based on the scripture and based on the reading of it, that God is putting out a majority of the effort because the children of Israel did not prosper against the Philistines when they tried, when they tried to do it on their own terms and by their own merit and by their own power. So nothing the children of Israel did was going to work without God behind them, but that didn't absolve them from the responsibility to show up and fight the battle as well. God did his part. He gave them the assistance that he promised them, but he also expected them to go out and fight that battle. And God expects us to do the exact same thing. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.